Happy Sabbath, brother. Good morning. It's good to be up here again. It's a privilege, really. When the Lord calls, we must heed the calling. And so that's what we're doing today. We're going to open the Word of God, and before we do, we're going to start off with a prayer. I'm going to kneel down, and I encourage you to uh, accompany with me. Gracious Father, thank you so much for one more day of life. Thank you for letting us wake up today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for bringing us here to your house of worship, Lord. We come so that you can instruct us to show us our condition, to show us the promises that you have for us, for those that want to be obedient. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit be upon this place, upon everyone here, all the visitors, everyone that's showing up today. It's not a coincidence that they're here today, but you have brought them here. So I ask that as we study your word, Lord, that the verses, everything that we look at may impact our lives, our hearts, our minds, so that we can reform our lives and disregard every, every sin that is in our lives as well, that we may leave it behind and come out of here renewed to a new spiritual life, Lord. I ask that you use me today and uh, be with everyone here and the ones that are on their way here, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you guys to open the Word of God to 2 Timothy, chapter 3, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 12. This is a very well-known verse. It's very, it's a very famous verse, well-known, but it's worth reviewing the principle that this verse is expressing. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Let's see what it says. Does somebody have it that can help me? What does 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 say? Anybody? Go ahead. Yeah. All that will live godly in Jesus Christ shall suffer persecution. Now, Jesus put it a little differently, but it means the same thing. And he expressed this in John 17. Let's go to John 17. Jesus uh, expresses the same thing, just a little bit different. John chapter 17 and verse 14. Let's see what John 17 and verse 14 says. Another volunteer? John 17 verse 14. And so here Jesus is speaking about his disciples. They're in the world, but not of this world. In the culture, but not of the culture. In the world of sin, but not participating in the world of sin. And that's what Jesus expressed. The same thing in, in, in uh, 2 Timothy that we just read. Now, I want to quote a, a, a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy that confirms these two verses that we just read and that we just seen. And it's, uh, it's very important that we understand what I'm trying to, to point to you guys. Because sometimes, you know, we think that persecution hasn't come because the Sunday law is not imposed yet. Or because the signs have not been fulfilled yet. Or because the calendar of God that has established all the events are not fulfilled yet. And so, I entitled my presentation today, Why Hasn't Persecution Come? I know there's people here that were little kids that are now grown old, that have known that persecution was going to come, that the events were going to take place in their time, but yet we're still here. And why hasn't persecution come? Why? I mean... There's people over in China and Iraq that are being persecuted. Christians are being persecuted. They're being killed. Canada, maybe Russia. But I'm speaking about the church in whole. Why hasn't the persecution come? 
Have you guys ever asked that question? We see the signs, we've read this, the Sunday law, but it still doesn't come. What's that? God's holding the four winds back. And so, the verse that we read, it says, all that will live godly, not all that believe godly. There's a big difference. And so, all, of those, all those that live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. And so we find this quote in the spirit of prophecy and the great controversy, page 48, on why the church isn't persecuted yet. You know, we give many excuses, many reasons, many pretexts why the persecution hasn't come. But brothers and sisters, there's only one reason why we're not suffering persecution. And as the spirit of prophecy is direct and very clear, it says, there is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches today. There's something very important that we must pay attention to, she says. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then she asks a question. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? Why has the persecution come? Let's see what she says. The only reason is, how many? Three? Five? One reason. The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of a pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, and the spirit of persecution will be revived, and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Why is the church not being persecuted today? Because the church has conformed to the world. Now, it's not saying that we must have a revival so that they can persecute us. It's saying that when there's a revival, eventually the persecution is going to come. It's very different. It's not talking about going and seeking persecution. It's talking about living godly. And the ultimate result of that is you're going to be persecuted. And so I'm going to show you guys a couple of examples in the Bible that, that illustrates this point. And so what the church needs today, my brethren, is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And so we don't need any more methods. We don't need any, any more excuses. We don't need any more uh, uh, doctrines. We need the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we don't need to argue about small things, about insignificant things. And what, when we do that, we divide. The church divides. And the Holy Spirit is not there. And so when, when the church sleeps... Guess who also sleeps? The devil. But when the church awakens, who awakens? The devil, right? And so I'm going to share with you some biblical examples of the verses that we just read. Uh, everyone that wants to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. And we're going to see why there is no persecution in the church. And so notice that it says here, let there be a revival of the faith and the power of the early church. How was the early church living before the Pentecost? Before the Holy Spirit came upon the early church, the disciples, how were they living? Were they not fighting amongst each other? Were they not quarreling against each other? They wanted to be the first in the kingdom. They, they were full of self, selfishness and pride. Remember that? They were fighting self-sufficiency. When Jesus said that a rich man shall hardly enter in the kingdom of heaven, what did Peter say? Lord, we left everything. We're poor. What position are you going to give me? Full of sufficiency. And on the same road to Jerusalem, two disciples were walking. 
discussing who was going to be the greatest, fighting amongst what position they wanted. And the mother of these two comes to, the, to Jesus and tells them, Jesus, when you put your kingdom, I want you to give my two little children the best position. Put one to the right and put one to the left. And what about the other disciples? Well, they're going to have to find another place. You see, self-sufficiency, pride. The disciples were afraid of losing their lives in this, in this moment when they were full of pride and self-sufficiency. And you remember Peter? I'll never deny you, Jesus. I'll go to death with you. And what happened in the testing time? Not to mention he ran away, right? And so, brothers, it's very important that you guys understand this point. That God cannot fill us with his holy power, with his Holy Spirit, without emptying ourselves first. Without emptying ourselves of selfishness, of pride, of anger, of resentment. Because God cannot fill something that is already full. We must be emptied before he can fill that. And so what happened in the ten days when they were in the upper room? These disciples, what happened to them? Were they praying a lot? Fasting? Were they studying? Were they saying sorry to each other? Were they uh, settling the differences? And then what happened? The outpouring of the Holy Ghost came, right? They were emptying of the, they were emptying themselves. What a change. And so were their conditions met before receiving the Holy Spirit? Yes. The conditions were in here. They were telling each other, I'm sorry. You know what they were doing? They were even giving away all their stuff because they didn't need it anymore. It was a great change. There were conditions that were met before they got the Holy Spirit. And so in chapter 1 of Acts, they are preparing. They're preparing. They're emptying themselves of, uh, of, uh, of self-pride, filling themselves with Christ. And in chapter 2 of Acts, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know that Jesus read to them the Holy Spirit twice? You guys know that? You guys ever seen that? That before the Holy Spirit came in full power, Jesus breathed them the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is in John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed, them on, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why did Jesus give them the Holy Spirit twice? Well, we need the Holy Spirit first so that he can empty us out of all our pride, out of all our selfishness, resentment. And then when we're emptied, the Holy Spirit comes and fills us. You notice that? Twice. And so, uh, gave, gave the Holy Spirit twice to them. And what happened in chapter 3 of Acts? Well, Peter and John are taken to jail. And they whip them really bad. Why did they whip them? Because they had received the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 of Acts. And so they had been emptied of self, emptied of themselves. And so why is the church, brethren, not persecuted today? Dare I say it, because the church has nothing to be persecuted. Because the church has nothing to be persecuted of. And so... God is very merciful, we say, because he's holding the four winds right now. That's true. But why is the church not persecuted? Because the church does not have the Holy Spirit. Dare I say it a little bit lighter? The church has very little Holy Spirit. That's why we're not persecuted. And it has very little Holy Spirit because there's so much self-sufficiency. And God cannot trust us with his power. There's quarrels against, e against each other. I don't want to sit over there. I don't like them. God cannot fill you with the Holy Spirit. And that's why the church doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Because we're not preparing like the disciples did in the upper room. God cannot trust us with his power. And notice that after they received the Holy Spirit... 
They went out and they preached. And what was the outcome? They were thrown in jail. And so, who wants to be persecuted then? Who wants to receive the Holy Spirit to get persecuted? Nobody does, right? That's what many people say. But you know, brethren, that God gives us the promises too. When we receive the Holy Spirit and are persecuted, he gives us the promise that he's going to uh, see us through this persecution. And so that's what Peter did. After Pentecost, he wasn't afraid of being whipped. He wasn't afraid of being thrown in jail. And you know what he did? I'm sorry. He went right back to the market where he got caught and thrown in jail, and he started preaching again. Was he afraid of losing his life then? No. no. What a big change, huh? What a big change in Peter. After being whipped, they went back to the same place. They weren't afraid. And so there were conditions met to receive this holy power. They had to empty of themselves. And that's what we must do today. And so I'm going to illustrate another point here. And this is found in the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39. The same sequence I, I want to show you guys. And so this is, uh, this is found in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's the famous uh, prophecy of Gog and Magog. Now we're not going to study that in detail. Uh, but I'm just going to summarize it here. It's a fascinating prophecy. You guys can study it when you guys get home. And it speaks about Satan's final persecution through the kings of the earth and through the religions of the earth, and they go against the remnant of God. And so the invasion of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And so Gog intends to come to the church, Jerusalem, and annihilate all the people of God. They come with this army, and they're coming to the city, and they want to annihilate them. And so who is Jerusalem symbolically? The people of God, right? The church. And so one night, in a decisive blow, they go around the city, and they want to exterminate it. And so why is God coming against Israel? Why is God coming against the church in the final days, this prophecy? Why is God coming to persecute Israel? Well, in the previous chapter, Ezekiel 37, is the famous uh, vision of the dry bones. Do you remember that? The dry bones. All scattered through the valley. Ezekiel comes to this valley and there's a bunch of bones everywhere. Skulls and, and, and limbs and everything. One bone here and one bone there. And the bones represent the house of Israel. And the people of God that were taken into captivity. They were taken into captivity and that was what represents all these bones that were scattered. But all of a sudden, God tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel, prophesy. Prophesy and send the wind on these bones or the spirit. And then the spirit comes and there's a big wind. And suddenly, all these bones start coming together. And then, meat starts attaching to the bones. And then, nerves start attaching to the meat. And then all of a sudden, skin starts attaching to the, to the, to the meat. And then, there stands a formidable United army of, of God. What is it that brings the persecution of God then in chapter 38 and 39? Well, what happened in chapter 37? They received the Holy Spirit and they became alive. They received the power of the Holy Spirit. But there's another point. Was there a condition that the, that the house of Israel had to meet to receive the Holy Spirit? Of course there was. And this is found in chapter 36 of Ezekiel. So when you guys go home, chapter 36, 37, 38, and 39. And so the condition is met in chapter 36. What they were doing there in order to receive the Holy Spirit in chapter 37 and in order for God to come to persecute them in chapter 38 and 39. Isn't that interesting? Wonderful, huh? The same thing that we have in Acts. The same sequence, preparation, Holy Spirit, persecution. That's what we're looking at. The same thing that was in Acts. 
And so Gog and Magog are coming against Israel because they have received the Spirit of God in chapter 36. And so, brethren, let me ask you today, how many of us are tired of living in this world? How many, how many, how many of us want to go, go home already? Man, you know, it seems like some of us like to live here. Are we happy in this world? How much more time do we have to spend here? Little time? A lot of time? Well, you know what? The time that we're here determines our preparation. If we're prepared or not, that's how much time we're going to be in this world. And so why hasn't the, the latter rain fallen? Isn't that the prophecy? Isn't that what we're waiting for? The latter rain to fall upon us, to give the great... Uh, the, is light in Revelation 18 to proclaim. And then what's going to happen? Persecution, right? Why hasn't the latter rain fallen then? Because we haven't received the early rain, brethren. And so here is the two outpourings of Christ in Acts. Early rain to prepare yourself, empty of yourself, remove all that resentment, all that anger, all that pride, and then so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I long for that day, brethren, when I can be able to have that full power of the Holy Spirit and tell the sick, get up and heal the sick. You know, God cannot trust us with that power today. You know why? Because if we're able to heal the sick, get up. You know what we would do? Mom, I healed the sick, Mom. We would draw attention to ourselves. We would tell everybody. We'll post it on Facebook. I healed the sick. And we would attract attention to ourselves. And that's why God cannot entrust us with that power yet. And so we must have to draw. I'm sorry. We would have to drain ourselves of selfishness, of pride. And so we have to meet certain conditions. And so another, another example is, is, uh, is found in Joel. Let's go to Joel. Joel chapter 2. Here's another example of the same sequence I'm, I'm showing you guys today. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And in Joel chapter 3. I'm just going to summarize it. What does Joel chapter 3 talk about? Well, it speaks about the kings of the earth as well, gathered around Jerusalem, just as we've seen in Gog and Magog. And they're surrounding the city. And it talks about the last judgment of God to the wicked people, Joel 3. And you know, those, those minor prophets, brethren, I suggest uh, it'll be good to read those and to study those. Haggai, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Joel. Ezekiel, because not only are they historic books, but they're prophetic books that shows what's going to happen in the end times. And so Joel 3 talks about the last battle uh, of the wicked coming against God's people, just as we've seen Gog and Magog. And so why are the wicked coming against God's people? Why do you think? Why do you think they're coming against God's people in the end? What? They don't want the truth? Well, what we've been looking at, uh, Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Does somebody have that? What does Joel 2 uh, verse 28 say? So the and then chapter and then verse twenty nine as well, brother. Why are they coming to annihilate the the people of God in the end time? Why? Because they have the Holy Spirit. You see that? And the prophetic gift will be alive in the final church, because the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. The gifts of the Holy Spirit will arise 
And so God is going to pour out their, his spirit on, his, on the church in these last days. And that's why these people are coming against them because they're prepared. Their character has been refined. And so let us ask, why is it that God gave these people here in Joel 22, 28, the Holy Spirit? Why? Was there a condition that they had to meet? Could it, could it be that they had to meet a condition to receive the Holy Ghost? And where is that condition? Where is that condition found? In the same chapter, Joel 2. Let's go look at verse 11. Joel 2, verse 11. Let's see what that says. And verse 12, too. You see that? It's the same thing as sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the earth. You see the sequence? Preparation. You receive the Holy Spirit. And then persecution. But sadly, brethren... Instead of sighing and crying for the abominations that are done on the earth, what we're doing is we're watching the abominations that are done on the earth on television. You see that? The phone. The abominations on the, on the phone. A and we can't receive the Holy Spirit that way. Verse 13 says, And rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. In other words, brethren, don't pretend you have a conversion. Real conversion goes within all the way in the heart. Verse 14 says there in, uh, in St. Joel 2, it says, Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him? Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sa uh, sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. And verse 17 says. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, where should they say among the people, Where is their God? This, this is what happened in the Day of Atonement. Aren't we living in the symbolically Day of Atonement today? And so what are we, we called to do? We're called to weep. We're called to repent. We're called to sanctify a fast. Repent. That's what we're supposed to do today. And so, you see Joel's thread? Preparation, Holy Spirit, persecution. Study those passages, brothers, and we'll find what we need to be able to receive the Holy Spirit in these days. And so, one last example that I want to show you is found in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 to 20. Revelation 14, verses uh, 14 through 16. We're going to study all the way through 20, but we're going to look first at 14 to 16. Let's see what that says. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud on upon the clouds, uh, as sat one like a, unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come to, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What does the harvest represent? It represents the saints. His saints. And where does Christ gather his harvest? In Jerusalem, 
in his church. Remember the scene in Joel 3? The wicked came against Jerusalem, against the church. So the saints are inside Jerusalem, and the wicked come and attack. They come to persecute because the people have received the Holy Spirit and because they met certain conditions. And they were what? They were ripe. Their character was ripe. Christ reaps the harvest. Verse 17. Uh, I skip 16, it says, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was, was reaped. Verse 17 says, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle! And gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. What do the grapes represent? The grapes represent the wicked. And where are the saints? In Jerusalem. And where are the wicked? Outside the city. They're coming against the city. And what are they coming to do? To attack people. And verse uh, 19 says, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trotted down with city, without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse brittles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And so why is it that the wicked are trotted down outside the city? Because they have come against the city to annihilate it. And why do they come to annihilate the city, the people of God? Well, because the people of God are right. They're ready. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And so they receive the latter rain. And they're ready. And so in Revelation 14, did you notice that we have the latter rain? The latter rain falls upon God's people. Their character is ripened. And then persecution comes against them. And so, where do we find the conditions then to get this latter rain in chapter 14? Where do you think we find the conditions that we have to meet? What's well, in the same chapter? Uh, and this is uh, very well known. It's the message of the three angels. We can find the message of the three angels, the conditions that you and I must meet in order to receive the latter rain. And so let's look at them really quick. And, and I encourage you to study the three angels' message, to understand it, because it goes far deep into what we've heard, because it hits, it hits right in the heart of, of one. And so here are the conditions that we have to meet. Revelation 14, we all know it. Verse 6, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. God's time to settle the accounts with you has come. It's time to examine yourself. It is that time that has come. God's time to look at you, at your character. What are you doing? That time has come. And so some people say, well, you think it's bad that, uh, that I drink a little coffee? You think it's bad, you know, that I go to a family gathering after church on Sabbath? You think it's bad if I watch a movie, if I listen to that? You think it's bad? Should it be that bad? And we ask these questions. And brothers, we can't receive the Holy Spirit asking those questions. We must give everything to the Lord. Our body, everything, our mind. We'll never receive the Holy Spirit asking those questions. We should seek to get as close as God and not seek to get close to the world. There must be a difference. People might have to see us and, well, that guy's different. Look at but what's happening today, that the church eats, talks, drinks, 
watches, everything like the world. There is no difference. We can't receive the Holy Spirit that way. And so remember what Jesus said? The world hated them because they're not of the world. And so what does the second angel's message say? Revelation 14, 7. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This message commands us to denounce Babylon and its false doctrines. Like the false doctrine that Sunday's the Sabbath, that the dead know everything, that hell burns forever, and he calls us to leave Babylon. And you know, brethren, perhaps the Adventist church is not teaching these false doctrines. But in the Adventist church, there's a lot of Babylonians. There's a lot of Babylonians because there are Adventists inside the church that have left Babylon, but Babylon has not left them. Just like, the, just like Lot's wife. They came out of Sodom, but Sodom did not come out of her. And so this second angel's message applies very much to us because we can be here in church, but our heart, our mind can be out in the world. And so... There, there are people who need to be called out of Babylon, even though they're inside the church. And so this message very much applies to us. And so let's go look at Revelation uh, 14, 9 and 10, the, thir the, third, the third message. The third angel's message says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with mi without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You know, we must, and some of us say, that doesn't apply to the Adventist church. That message applies to the evangelicals out there, all the Catholics, all the Pentecosts out there that don't have the Sabbath truth. That doesn't apply to us. We know what the mark of the beast is. But you know, brethren, that this message applies very well to us. The Spirit of Prophecy says, Great Controversy 85, when the, testing time shall, when the testing time shall come, when is that testing time? Sunday law, right? Those who have made God's word their rule of life will be revealed. In summer, there is no noticeable difference between evergreens and other trees. But when the blast of winter come, the evergreens remain unchanged. While other trees are stripped of their foliage, so the false-hearted professor may not, may not now be dis distinguished from the real Christian. But the time is just upon us when the difference will be apparent. Let what? Oh, sorry. Let opposition arise. Let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway. Let persecution be kindled. And the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christian will stand firm as a rock, his faith stronger, his hope brighter than in the days of prosperity. So those who insist in remaining lukewarm will become cold and join the enemy, the ranks of the enemy. They will become the worst enemies of their own brethren. And so beware of worshiping the beast. And his image, it applies to all of us in the Adventist church. Because we're in danger of continuing to be lukewarm to go to the enemy's side. And so, another quote from the Spirit of Prophecy says, Human laws will be made so stringent that men and women will not dare to observe the seventh-day Sabbath. For fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be holy under my dominion, says Satan. Laws are going to become so stringent, brethren. Man, I need to eat. I need to feed my children. God understands. I love you, Lord. Things are going to get bad. And so, brothers, Scripture is very clear on the subject of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is clear that com persecution comes because the church has been revived and has been filled with the Holy Spirit. But 
There's conditions that we have to meet. There's conditions that we have to meet in order to receive the Holy Spirit. And receiving the Spirit doesn't mean an emotion. doesn't mean a celebration. It's a, it's a daily struggle. It's a daily uh, walk of repentance. And so receiving the Holy Spirit is confession, is dejection, is sadness of sin. It doesn't mean going to church and saying, Amen, hallelujah, when my heart doesn't say hallelujah, when I'm thinking about other things. And so the church must be confessing, brethren, sighing and crying for the abominations that, that are done in the earth leaving all resentment behind, self-pride, selfishness, quarrels amongst each other. I can't stand that guy. I don't want to sit with him. We have to leave that or else we're not going to receive the Holy Ghost. We have to be praying, studying, fellowship, fellowshipping, calling the sin by its name. And so, brethren, let us thank the Lord for this message today because this message goes straight to me. You know, I, I must do a change as well. Everyone does. And so I want to leave with one last quote, brethren, before I finish. This is found at uh, Last Day Events, page 189. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. What's our first work? To seek godliness, right? There must be an earnest effort to obtain the blessings of the Lord. Not because God is not willing to bestow his blessings upon us. Because why? Because we're unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give God gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. A revival need to be expected only in answer to prayer. And so here is the condition to receive the Holy Spirit, brethren. Confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer. You know, there's people that don't like to pray anymore. There's people that don't like to study anymore. They're too busy. I don't have time today. I'm so tired. We're not going to receive the Holy Spirit that way. And so, so brethren... This is my message for for us today. Uh, This primarily applies to me, and I hope that coming out of here, we can can ask the Lord for forgiveness to help us, to give us strength to endure, and uh, and God will do that. He's willing to give us his Holy Spirit. All we have to do is ask. It says ask. He's willing to give it to us, but we don't ask. 